Hey everyone, and welcome to episode five of Rethinking with Alex Torpy. Uh, thanks for joining us here. So in the last episode, we talked about how the process by which we have conscious thoughts, have ideas, form preferences, make decisions, take action, all happen very differently than what it feels like on a day-to-day -day basis. Instead of consciousness being in the driver's seat, at best it's emerging very late or possibly at the end of a chain of events. And assuming that we do have some control over our conscious thoughts and we get past all the decisions that get outright made in your subconscious, what your conscious mind can and can't do is heavily influenced by your unique biological makeup, what your subconscious mind vets for your conscious mind, which we know to be a lot, and by dynamics in the environment around you, hundreds and thousands of factors that are influencing what you think, how you feel, and what you do on a daily basis, every moment since you were born. And almost all of this is passing by outside of your awareness. But don't be overwhelmed by this, because the universe is really fucking strange, and really coming to terms with that can actually open up some pretty cool doors. So a good example are neutrinos. Uh, these are elementary particles that are not dissimilar from an electron but without any charge and hardly any mass or no mass. Because of how weakly they interact with matter, we're hardly able to notice them as they travel at light speed around the universe. But somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 billion of these particles pass through your body every second that you're standing in sunlight. And we're none to the wiser. Understanding that things like this are happening all around us, every microsecond of every day, going back billions of years, and all happening outside of the really narrow spectrum that our senses can perceive should help serve to normalize the idea that most of your thoughts actually go by undetected as well, and that our conscious awareness is just the tip of a very deep and very strange iceberg um, that once you explore it, it will almost seem like an entirely new world. And what people have done for nearly the entire short lifetime of our species is build entire ideologies, worldviews, philosophies, religious beliefs, political institutions, entire societies and ways of life without knowing these facts about how we think and how we act, without realizing what influenced them to think or believe or behave the way that they did. And I personally believe that our present failure in modern times to recognize and begin to incorporate the evidence provided by modern science about how our minds work is the single most significant root cause of nearly all of the problems that we see around us, causing the massive mismatch in anticipated outcomes and observed outcomes in the systems that constantly make us feel like we're fighting a never-ending battle to try and fix everything. But it doesn't have to be that way or feel that way. And in fact, it only feels like that because all of the energy that we're putting in is really just nipping around the edges at the symptoms, not the causes. Looking at just the tiniest end of a chain of events that you could argue is millions or billions of years old. You don't put out a fire by extinguishing the little bits around the edge. You extinguish it by going directly to the source. That's what we're trying to do in the series. And that's why we're talking about these concepts. So... We talked in the last episode about how our brains and minds work. In this episode, we're going to talk about how misunderstandings about that got built into the systems around us. And then after that, we're going to talk a little bit about what that means for the people who run the systems currently. Now, first, we need to talk about our ancestors. We've got to look at some history. And this is, these are not ancestors that you can find on uh, you know, Ancestry.com or something. But these are ones that existed before we were human, before we were homo sapiens. Um, and so let's talk about how primates and primate societies are organized. Now this is important to do because we inherited most of the behaviors that we're going to be covering more from them. Um, and understanding our past can help us understand our present and our future. Now in my own personal opinion, looking at animal behavior I kind of find it like watching or reading really good science fiction because you're engaging with a world that's both incredibly strange and incredibly familiar at the same time. And sometimes those weird differences and similarities allow you to sort of question things that you might not be able to do without taking that distance 
Um, so what, uh, what I want to cover is how primate ancestors lived and still, and primates still live. And this is in a very top-down, linear, patriarchal, uh, societal organization structure. And we share about 98.8% .8 of our DNA with chimpanzees. And they are our closest primate ancestor along with bonobos. And we inherited much about the way that we live and the way our brains and bodies work from them, including, as you'll see, the way that we design our political systems. Our chimpanzee societies are very top-down, alpha male run organizations. And this means there is basically one male at the top and that male has total authority over every other member of the group. That male protects his group from other groups as well as enforces various rules within the group. Now challenging this male is not something that you can typically do on one specific issue. For example, hey boss, uh, you know, can we move to find a different area to, to look for food? But rather it's done on what we can call a winner takes all basis, which might sound more like I'm gonna fight you for this position of alpha male and then when I win and I'm in charge, I'll make the decisions about where we get the food and everything else. Now, in chimpanzee societies, loyalty is extremely important, but only in a way that we might imagine if Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright grew a lot more hair. <laughs> it's my best House of Cards reference I can do. Now, this is because it's been observed that among chimpanzees, loyalty is important, but it's not selfless or some sort of value-driven or altruistic loyalty. It's loyalty used specifically as a tactic to maximize one's own advancement up the political ranks or for protection against the challenge of others. And for those of you who work in politics, you might recognize some of this. Now, although collaborative social bonding is indeed an important aspect of how individuals within these groups form relationships and work together for their group, it's all done under the authority of one male and all done directly in service of your group over any outside group in a system that is built on violent overthrows of leadership um, as the primary way that leadership is transitioned from one individual to the next. Now, outside groups are often met with intense displays of and actual uses of violence. When out patrolling territory, chimps have been known to literally wipe out entire societies they encounter in very violent ways, except for the adult females, of course, who they then try to incorporate back into their own group. There's a major ethical distinction that group members have hardwired into their brains, one's own group superiority over others. And this makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint in environments with scarce resources. This interest in protecting our own can be specifically traced and mathematically observed in how primates act in responses to threats to direct family members, distant family members, or other group members. There is a measurable priority level given. Nature has actually hardwired into our brains the interest in protecting those with as close genetic material to ourselves to help us pass down our own genes from generation to generation. Now take a moment and reflect on this fact that humans and primates are genetically programmed to protect themselves and others in a way that has been specifically designed to pass down your genetic material or the genetic material of those who most closely resemble you to future generations. Can you imagine that dynamic being involved in a fundamental layer of human activities? We're gonna come back to this point later because this distinction, the hardwired prioritization of other life based on their genetic resemblance to yourself, I personally believe is the main dynamic that creates the space for much of our prejudice and the justifications for religious or racial or sexual and other types of violence, especially those based on classes of individuals, for all of that to exist. It's all reliant on a mental model that doesn't just allow for placing lives in a priority list, but which sorts that list based on how closely other, others are genetically to yourself. Now, both outside and inside the group, the alpha male will employ a number of tactics, such as displays of strength or violence to discourage challengers. And what's really interesting is that it has been notably observed that even in groups where the alpha male is actually in a relatively stable position at the top of the ladder as the alpha male, he will still be frequently insecure and display violence to discourage challengers and restate his position to everyone else. 
this type of behavior has often actually been called something like insecurity and should probably remind you of some human behaviors, especially by those in power who are being challenged. Again, some behaviors that might feel familiar to some people who've worked in politics. Now, this alpha male will have ultimate authority over decisions of the group, usually until relieved of the position through violence by a challenger. Now, if you thought that our primate ancestors and most animals, you know, lived peacefully and worked together like they do in a Pixar movie, you would be gravely mistaken. And our primate ancestors are capable, capable of bonding and affection and maybe even something similar to love as we understand it, and really some other wonderful traits that we inherited. But they also do some horrifically violent things, which we also inherited. This would include some of the following. Sometimes what male chimpanzees will do who are looking for a female mate is that they will secretly murder the newborn babies of a mother such that it prompts the mother biologically to begin the process of looking for a new mate to reproduce again. And then that chimpanzee stops by and says, oh, you know, I'm sorry to hear about your baby that I secretly murdered, but just by coincidence, you know, I'm single and I'm available. Pretty crazy. This also includes that nearly 100% of sex among orangutans before they become adults, and more than 50% of it once they become adults, is forced intercourse by the males upon the females, which the females are observed to trying to fight against. This type of horrible violence and the societal philosophies that underpin it being acceptable behavior are all part of our roots and what our species is based on. And if you really think for a moment about the numerous and horrifying ways that humans have implemented violence throughout our recorded history, the idea that we evolved from animals that did things like secretly murder newborns to encourage their mothers to mate with them, it actually shouldn't feel counterintuitive. This is all part of our family tree, and we have to be honest um, and reconcile those things. But what's important to note is that not all animals make decisions about things that impact the whole group in this type of way with an alpha male-led uh, group. In fact, even among mammals, there's actually a real diversity of organizing structures. So one that's maybe a little more well-known um, and a good example are elephant societies that are typically matriarchal, where groups of mothers take care of groups of children together. These are societies where the oldest or wisest elephants with the most knowledge of where to find the resources stored in their good memories, are the ones who tend to make decisions on where to look for water. Not the biggest elephant who violently overthrew the prior lead elephant. Elephants don't fight and kill each other in a complex web of political and social dynamics to get power in their group the way that primates do. Most likely it evolved that way because this is the organizing structure that works best for that particular animal. But remember that all of these animals are inheriting a hardwired organizing structure. We are the only one with the intelligence and ability to have context on what we inherit such that we can actually change the system itself. And we'll come back to that. But first, a couple other interesting examples. Bats are another mammal that have some kind of interesting behaviors about how they organize their societies. Now, I mentioned in the last episode that bats basically believe in karma and this is vampire bats specifically, they have, some, uh, they have these small sacs near their throats that they use to fill up with blood, which they get for the sole purpose of feeding to their infants. So that should take a little bit of the grossness out for people who don't like the idea of vampire bats. The blood they collect is only done to feed their little new babies. Now, bats are expected to share if they have more than they need. So if they come back and they have extra blood, um, they're expected to share that with other bat families. And there are rigorous enforcement mechanisms built into their societies to ensure this cooperation. Studies have shown this repeatedly. If a bat's throat sac is artificially inflated with air so that it looks like it has a full serving of blood in there, but it actually has nothing, it then won't share what it has with others when it comes back because it has nothing. Other bats will notice this sac having been full and that nothing was shared and the offending bat will not be given extra blood the next time it needs some for its own infant. And this rule works really well. Bats expect all members to contribute towards the common goal of feeding the group and helping ensure the survival of the young. 
Now, I bet my taxes would be lower and my streets and sewer infrastructure and electric infrastructure and healthcare system and education systems would all be easier to afford and in a better condition if we enforced the same rigorous standards in our society of everybody contributing uh, a little more to help out those who can't and punishing those who withhold what they are expected to contribute. But as we often find, we reward some of those companies and other individuals. And we'll be certainly coming back to that. Now, zooming out even farther, in one of the more interesting contrasts are bees. They have a very different framework for how decisions are made in their bee societies. Now, you've probably heard of the queen bee, but this is not really a political position. It's a position of being the central point of reproduction in the society. The queen bee doesn't really make any or most, really any of the decisions of the hive. Rather, the hives have a complex decision-making system in place that allows all of the members to contribute towards the goals that advance the interests of the group. And what bees do is they perform this complex series of dances known as the waggle dance or the circle dance or the round dance. And this is to help communicate and vote on where the best sources of food are actually located. So scout bees will go out and look at locations and come back to the group and then they perform this dance, which perhaps I'll show on the screen or I'll certainly include a link to. The intensity and duration of the dance describes the details about the food source, including its quality and the location. This has been observed now for, I believe, about 100 years. And yeah, I will definitely link to some videos because it's pretty cool to see because we understand what different parts of the dance actually relate to. And it's so accurate that it can, it can communicate locations um, up to uh, miles away. And so what basically happens is once the bees come back and do the waggle dance, other bees notice this waggle dance and they go follow the instructions and find the food source. And if they agree with uh, that it's a good food source, they will come back and do that waggle dance also. And at a certain point, more and more bees will start going out and verifying and doing that waggle dance. And it will sort of start to take over the entire hive or colony. And at a certain point, the decision becomes made and uh, the entire group, the entire hive, will actually move and relocate, um, if needed, to the new location um, of a food source. In this system, there is no lying or manipulation for one bee's own personal gain or murdering other bees so that your report on the best food source is accepted and you advance in favor by the queen and move up in the political ranks to a more powerful position. Scouts who are wrong or whose suggestions aren't acted on don't get punished or kicked out while others get to make the decisions. They don't have to face a challenge from another bee the next time there's a decision to be made because each time the hive makes a decision, they implement the same system where any bee can potentially be the source of the best suggestion. They all just continuously participate in a relatively representative and egalitarian ecosystem where each scout makes the case for what they think is best and based on those results, the colony will decide where to shift its resources. Now, although there is a little bit of top-down leadership in parts of a bee society from the queen, it really isn't um, how these decisions are made, and there is huge space created for this democratic decision-making, um, like on important issues like where the hive is going to live and where the food sources are. Now, could the existence of a democratic decision-making scheme within a bee society, or sort of similar in the elephant society, have anything to do with the leadership being matriarchal instead of patriarchal? I personally think it's kind of an interesting question. But this decision-making system is nearly on the opposite end of the primate system. Instead of focusing on placing an individual in charge who you agree with and we are aligned with to get the best outcomes, the bees trust in the collective knowledge of the entire society and designed a system to always try to get the best result every time they have to make a really big decision that affects everyone. There's no sides, there's no teams, and there's no winning or losing. The decision-making system used for many big, important decisions by elephants or bees versus primates, for example, should serve as just the tip of the iceberg in understanding how many different decision-making frameworks there actually are out there and how different things can be from the way that we inherited them from our primate ancestors. Everything about how the system that facilitates decision-making is built on a specific and identifiable uh, dynamic 
with biological and scientific terms that we can use to break these systems down into core elements that all preceded our political parties or even our country or our species. The default thing we inherited is like a base layer program, a BIOS, which is the part of a computer device that basically runs the software before the operating system can be loaded. And that underpins almost everything that we do. What's so cool is that we have the knowledge to be able to identify it, label it, and show it in a list of other decision-making systems such that we can compare apples to apples and actually look at the different pros and cons of different systems and choose whichever one is best suited for our goals and which may be different than the goals that got us to this point. This is one of the really cool parts about being human. We get access to a rooted version of the phone that we can manipulate and reload to do new and exciting things, while other animals just kind of inherit the operating system as is. And the fact that in our mostly uh, unintentional scientific inquiries, we've already found an arguably more nuanced and evidence-based decision-making system existing among animals with a brain that is only one cubic millimeter large. That should give us some uh, optimism about what we are capable of, because I believe that we are capable of truly great things that most of us can barely begin to imagine. To get there, we just have to put everything on the table and question it all. We have to know what's really possible to understand the unbelievably limited scope of what we thought things were previously. Okay, so we've looked at a few interesting examples from the animal kingdom to try and give us a little context into how different some different animals make decisions or incentivize leadership. Let's next talk about how the primate system has sort of been translated into our modern world. And although some of these concepts apply to different fields, I'm going to keep this focused mostly on the political and government world. Now, before we get into this um, discussion of our modern political system, it's important to reflect that for most of human history, we have had systems organized around us that operate very similarly to the way that our systems do now in some of the most fundamental philosophies built into them. Yes, we have made lots of changes and advancements, but many of the really core philosophies that underpin these systems actually haven't changed that much, or in some cases at all. And don't get me wrong, the government that we have in the United States, I personally believe, is literally a milestone advancement in the evolution of our species. It was the first democratic society built at scale and upended the idea that ruling is something that you are literally born into. Or at least it called out that issue and for the first time put it on the table as sort of an aspirational goal and codified a way at scale to have a system that isn't built on being born into royalty, but is built on some other mechanism that sources leadership from the general population to some degree. Um, now, my own, my own personal interpretation of the founding of this country is that much of what was built into the founding, uh, uh, much of that was built into the founding documents, uh, you know, what you can find in the Federalist Papers or Declaration of Independence or the Constitution itself, they were not just changing how something worked at that moment, but they were laying out a vision and aspirational goals for th what things can be. They certainly didn't accomplish many of those goals that they laid out at the time. But many of these goals discussed in the founding of the country are goals that are actually part of this vision for a better world that I am trying to describe. But we have to be honest with where we found success with this particular form of government and where we have not found success. An incredibly revolutionary thing was done um, in the creation of this country that likely sparked democratic developments in much of the rest of the world. A truly remarkable innovation in governance that I am still in awe of every time I pick up a letter or document written by any of our founders or I read something on the founding of the country or on the Constitutional Convention. But it was also done at a time when people believed some truly incredibly wrong things about the world including vastly misunderstanding how we think, our consciousness, why we act certain ways, and the reasons that we look at things the way that we do around us. In fact, the vast majority of well-educated people in 2021 still misunderstand these things, so certainly not blaming people in the 1700s. It's something I have a little trouble describing, but is important to note is the realism with which I want to approach everything holding nothing up as something that we venerate without validating, 
No person, no idea, no event, no concept is off limits to questioning in this series. And nothing should be held up as all knowing. Yes, the political system that I'm about to describe was a milestone advancement in the uh, development of our species, but it was several hundred years ago. And in that time, we have made truly astounding progress in science and medicine and technology and so much more. And yet we have made little to no progress in advancing our political systems. And in many ways, uh, with, I would argue, various things actually getting worse as problems arise that could have never been anticipated 250 years ago. So it's time for us to step back and give ourselves the distance from our day-to-day -day operating in these systems to be able to look at them more accurately and describe them using some of the new knowledge that we've discussed so far. By applying the knowledge that we've gained about how we think and act and function, we can create a new understanding of what's wrong and what we can do about it. Now, in our political system and much of the world, but especially the Western world, um, though I'm going to be focusing mostly, really primarily on the United States here, is designed that in almost all organizational units there is a boss, a capital B boss. And throughout history, this has been almost always men, especially at higher level organizations. This boss is the singular entity in control. And bosses, whether a CEO or a director or a chairman or a mayor or a party boss, they don't really volunteer to share their power with their opponents, nor do they typically create spaces where a defeated party or individual is allowed to even have a seat at the table to provide their alternate viewpoints to be taken into account whenever a decision is being discussed or being made. Rather, what happens is that the winner of whoever's in the position, the boss, marshals all of their resources to get themselves and their side into power, and then does everything possible to remove the opponents from power, ultimately working to secure as much control over whatever the system is as possible by their people. This is what we do in the United States at virtually all levels of government all of the time, but it's so deeply built into our politics that you might not really even be aware of it. Now, in our politics and our government world, we might recognize these attempts at having total control over a system by more civilized sounding and modern labels, such as having a veto-proof majority, or taking back the house, or getting our people into office. But the concept is the same, and it's simple. The ultimate goal of both of our two major parties and almost all political leaders or bosses in the United States is to control as many of the voting and decision-making positions in all three branches of government at every level as much as possible. The more you control, the better. The less your opponents control, the better. All activities must forward this singular goal above all else. Everything. Operating outside of that framework is largely prevented, punished, and railroaded when it does happen, which is very rare. Virtually every incentive and tool and thing that happens in the political world is being done for this ultimate goal, regardless of what reasons may be given or what alternate reasons may exist, even the good-sounding ones. And you can uncover this easily by asking, if this thing had the opposite reaction among your political base, would you still do it? For example, if a Republican would lose political support by advocating for tax cuts, would they do it? Or if a Democrat would lose political support by suggesting improvements to services um, to a community in need, they wouldn't do it if they were going to lose political support. It doesn't matter what the individual politicians actually believe. It just matters to understand what their political goals are. And you'll find that virtually all of their actions, minus their mistakes, fit neatly into forwarding those political goals. And it's pretty easy to predict which way a politician will vote on something by understanding the political dynamics of where they get elected in um, and what their party is doing. You can basically fill in the rest with a pretty high success rate. And because their stated philosophy is that they are right and the other side is wrong, and there's some sort of biblical angel versus devil vibes with this ideology. But they're able to publicly justify this goal of having total control over the system and needing it without being seen as some sort of horrible, power-hungry, insane dictator 
Because why would you share power with people who are wrong and who want to do bad things? You would never do that. Look at them and how ignorant they are and how wrong they are and how corrupt they are. We can't let them control City Hall or the State House or the White House. They are ruining everything. They must be stopped. Their own supporters are misguided and voting against their own interests by supporting them. Think about how many times things like this have been said. This has been said over and over and over in every election that I've ever seen since I started paying attention to high school, practically every election. It's the ideology built into virtually every campaign, every, each of the parties, and every candidate for public office. But the reality is that one side is right and the other is wrong, that that philosophy is just complete bullshit pretty much no matter who is saying it at any, whatever point in time. One side always being the good guys and one side being always the bad guys, although there's certainly surely specific times where there's somebody that's right and somebody that's wrong, that philosophy itself and its usage to define entire groups of millions of people into one group of right or wrong is a lie. And it is a lie used to perpetuate the power dynamics built into the system that benefit a very small few and disadvantage most of us. And I've talked about this before in prior episodes. I don't believe that there is any one person or one ideology or one side that has it all right. That's an assumption built into my ideology in this podcast. Anyone can be right or wrong about any particular thing. But that belief makes it much harder to wage the kinds of false wars that keep us in a perpetual state of tug of war with each other over the power in our society, which is exactly what certain people and interests want us to be doing. And hey, conveniently, it's exactly how our brains are wired, starting in primate times, to differentiate our group with people who have a closer genetic makeup to us over other groups of people who have a more distant genetic makeup to us. But if you peel back the really incredibly naive idea that there can be a right side and a wrong side, um, and, and, and that this is built, that this same idea of one organized religion being right and, and another being wrong, or that citizens of one country are somehow more deserved than citizens from another country, it should be easy to see that the reality of the most important value in our political system, it's the exact same value that allows an alpha male to hold authority over a group of chimpanzees in contrast to another group. This idea that one person can just be right and another and deserving of total authority and another can just be wrong and deserving of no authority. Part, you're either, in this ideology, you're right or you're wrong. You're part of the group or you're not. You're in power or you're not in power. But, to, but that differentiation is a creation of one particular set of evolutionary conditions that primates faced. Not some sort of God-given ex you know, truth built into how humans must act or how animals must act. It's how chimpanzees developed, but it's not how bees developed. And we happen to come from chimpanzees. Now, I know there may be some of you listening who are unsure about this or maybe even sort of offended by this. But the actual fact is that any individual or organization that wants to remove all disagreement from opposition individuals such that they and their loyalists can have total control over any decision-making system is operating in a 100% authoritarian, dictatorial, alpha male, patriarchal mindset. There is no logical way to reconcile this behavior with any of the expressed modern values such as democracy, representation, inclusivity, diversity, etc., etc. And ultimately, there is no way to even reconcile it with the stated values in our Constitution and founding documents. You can't, on one hand, express values of democracy and fairness and access and everybody being equal, um, and then have as your primary goal the accumulation of power over a system such that you can systematically remove all people on the other side from being able to even participate in the group decision-making, even when that other side represents the viewpoint of a significant number of group members. In our case in the U.S., the other side represents the expressed views of literally tens of millions of fellow countrymen and countrywomen who had no more or less control over what ideologies they inherited and what they believed than you do, which is to say almost no control. 
But this systemic takeover of the systems that control public things in the United States is exactly what po both parties attempt to do in every single election. And we all buy into it and perpetuate it. And we do so partially because being on the right side and feeling righteous in your beliefs and actions feels so freaking good. It feels so good to be on the side of the righteous and to fight people who are evil and wrong. It makes it easy to dehumanize others and it makes it easier to do things that you normally might not do because you believe it's all for the right reasons and that you are on the side of the right reasons. It's kind of scary to admit that the world isn't as simple as having one right side and one wrong side and that basically we have no right to feeling any more morally superior over any other human. But we've been doing this dance for hundreds and for thousands of years in many different forms. Maybe we installed the software of democracy at one point along the way, but it's on top of the operating system of primate patriarchy. And this democracy software provides a pretty limited value because it operates within the narrow scope of a system that is at a more fundamental layer and has contradictory values. It only feels like a democracy because having a feeling of democracy and a right and wrong side to something is the easiest way to ensure that people don't dig any deeper and that everybody plays kind of within the rules that you give them. Try thinking about it this way. The ridiculous idea of having a right side and a wrong side guarantees that every single person can have a position on the right side. All you have to do is believe you're on the right side. Now, does this sound like anything familiar? The increasingly extreme and stubborn belie growing beliefs in one's own interpretation of events and ideas? In this system, you get to have a constant war where everybody in the war believes they are on the righteous side and that they are fighting evil opponents. And what that means is the war will never end. Reflect on this truth and ultimately how ridiculous it really is, especially because neither of these sides are actually right, which we can demonstrate pretty easily through some of the analysis of different issues that we will be doing in future episodes. Nobody has a claim to being right all the time. And really, if we actually believe in the value of democracy that most of us say we do, we should be unwilling to allow any one side to ever be right and have the belief in its own moral superiority over other sides. Now let's dig a little bit deeper here because this is a really important concept to sort of wrap our heads around. And it's the ultimate driving goal of either party to take control and kick the other side out. So once installed and in power, the moral authority of these bosses is seen as basically absolute, right? both from their own perspective as well as the perspective of the system they now govern. In most cases, the others, the opponents, don't actually get to participate in any of the governing. In most cases, political opponents are systematically removed from government agencies and appointments to make way for people loyal to the now ruling party. Now, importantly, once out of power or not in the majority any longer, the defeated individual or party is largely remanded to a role that is actually outside of the governing process. They now have the job of voicing disagreement, but it is not to voice disagreement to change the policy so that the policy incorporates their concerns, but it's because once the other side gets to 50 plus one on most issues, it doesn't matter from a governance perspective what the people who disagree think. Rather, this disagreement is floated with sometimes the opposite effect intended, with the hopes that the policy doesn't actually change. Disagreement is voiced by those out of the power so that those voicing the disagreement can continue to drum up support for their side so that in the next election, they can attempt to remove the ruling party from power and install themselves and install their party. Now, once installed, they then inherit that same absolute authority and they can finally accomplish their agenda and put America on the right track or make whatever great again. And you start the cycle all over again. And we are simply going back and forth here ad infinitum every election at every level of government in this country with no fucking end in sight. 
Even as serious but solvable problems continue to mount and create a crushing burden on current and future generations. Instead of creating a thoughtful and carefully designed system that forces us to actually hash out disagreements and solve problems that the majority of people are behind, we just keep yanking absolute power back and forth between representatives from two opposing sides, who each claim that they are entirely right, but neither of whom is actually right, and both of whom are operating within and violently perpetuating the chimpanzee style of patriarchal rule that is built in to what we inherited in our DNA. Although there are plenty of studies that show that groups of diverse but ordinary individuals actually can do better at various types of uh, decision making and have left less blind spots, that experts who are all of the same opinion, our entire ideology of how we see organizations run is built on the opposite of that. And having organizations with false positive feedback loops that reinforce the pre-existing beliefs of the bosses with this fake loyalty that we sort of use. This is one of the most detrimental dynamics that exists in our culture, and especially in our government. And although there are some interesting examples worth touching on in later episodes where some progress has definitely been made in doing a little better in building more representative and productive systems, we have not done so at scale in the U.S., nor in most of the world, especially the Western world. In the U.S., we don't want disagreements in the governing process. Instead, we want to work out our disagreements once in the voting booth where there is total authority given almost entirely to usually one of just two different options that we're presented with. Both of whom, both of options, both of those options which were selected through an incredibly biased process that is only open to the smallest slice of Americans. Often single digit percentages of populations actually casting affirmative votes for the person who won in the election through ridiculous rules about primaries and general elections in districts that have been carefully drawn to allow certain parties the exact number of votes needed to stay in power. The infamous New York City political boss of the 1800s, Boss Tweed, said it best. I don't care who does the voting as long as I do the nominating. And we can talk about corruption in our political system more, which we will, um, but I think most of you are aware that that process of getting individuals to the ones that are actually on the ballot is a pretty, uh, is a pretty narrow process that is not representative. So a ridiculously exclusive group of a small number of influential and typically already powerful individuals install an alpha male at the top and intentionally exclude all opposition from decision making through various rules and procedures. And those opponents only recourse now is to not actually participate in the decision making and help craft the solutions, but to work towards overthrowing and assuming that leadership in the next election. And while we burn billions of dollars directly on campaign spending during each major election, we lose exponentially more billions um, in money and in opportunity from the consequences of a consistently subpar policy and governance um, that this system produces. Not only are the collective goals of this system far out of line with what most people actually want to see, but the system is so poorly performing that it can barely accomplish the goals that it says it wants to. We're desensitized to the catastrophic failings of public institutions because we are surrounded by them. But make no mistake, we have the existing resources to solve many of the problems that we currently allow to fester and to grow. But we will never address these issues properly, whether it's the rising debt or rising temperatures, using a system that is literally built on the exact same ideologies and methodologies that 100 chimpanzees used to survive in a rainforest with their group over another group hundreds of thousands of years ago. That system has gotten us really far. It really has. But so did having tails and swinging from branches. But it's not what we need anymore. And we have to question some of these assumptions if we're going to take the next steps, just as our ancestors did by leaving the rainforest and beginning to stand upright and walk on the savannas. Now, I am really screwed here if Planet of the Apes ends up happening. And just for the record, for our future primate overlords, I'll just say that I do love animals, including the primate ancestors, but I don't love their political systems. And I think we can, and really it's the duty of our generation and this time on this planet right now to take the next step in our species journey 
towards being more and more civilized and figure out how we can do this all better with the knowledge that we now have. But this all might still sound a little weird and we don't have time to get really far into it. So I've taken a little bit to break down some things um, that I'll put up for those of you watching on YouTube um, so that we can uh, kind of discuss some of the core concepts here and how they specifically relate to how our political system operates. So we want to think of a scale and on one end is an entirely top-down hierarchy, sort of similar to the primate style, perhaps. And on the other end might be something more resembling a bee society that is totally decentralized. If we're to put down where our systems are on the scale, there'd be, uh, where our system is on the scale, it would be more towards that primate end. And I'm going to call this type of a system a winner-takes-all style. And if we reflect that to the other side, so we take the opposite, maybe something closer to the B side of things, we have something that I've been calling um, for the last few years institutional plurality, although I don't love this name, so feel free to send me any suggestions about it once you've listened to it, all of this. And so for those of you watching, again, I'll put a little uh, kind of chart up um, or a table um, so you can see this, but we've got the scale with the primate really heavy top down on one side and the more kind of collectivist on the other side. And I draw these contrasts to show something, not to advocate for one option or another option. And just remember that having to choose between two static choices is a creation. We don't have to, we don't have to allow that to constrain our thinking. This is a scale that we want to be able to discuss all the different sort of details of. Now, before we continue, there's just two things that I uh, want to address um, again here. So the first is... Um, I'm not proposing a solution here uh, one way or the other. Really what I just want to do is draw out a couple examples of different ways things can be done, leaning on a couple of these different examples from the animal kingdom. And that should sort of help broaden the perspective of how decisions and groups of animals can be made. Um, and what I want to do is sort of kickstart your imagination about how that could look, um, how what we do could look, um, if it were organized on kind of a different platform, one other than what we inherited from our primate ancestors. Um, the second point is that we're not getting into the practicality of how to implement a new system because we don't really have a solution picked out yet. We're just exploring the concepts. But in subsequent episodes, we're going to be doing this. We're going to go, we're going to be connecting some of these concepts directly to different policies and programs in government, different ways that you can manage your personal life and things in your professional life. Um, so again, this is just sort of an overall conceptual discussion um, meant to help broaden our perspective a little. And we're going to get more into details as we get um, into future episodes. All right, so we want to compare these two different kind of scales here. So on the winner takes all side, uh, the trust in the system is placed in specific individuals. On the institutional plurality side, the individual matters less and the trust is placed in the system itself. On the winner takes all side, there is a disincentive to redesign the system. Rather, you're just taking people out kind of as you advance forward. Whether, versus on an institutional plurality side, uh, you might um, be more likely to redesign uh, the system. And the outcomes being changed in the winner takes all is accomplished by changing the individuals out for another individual who has a different belief. But in an institutional plurality design, you don't do it that way. You don't change the outcomes by changing the individuals. You change the outcomes by changing the systems themselves or changing the formulas or processes or methodologies. In a winner-takes-all system, the elections tend to be about ideologies, expressed ideologies and virtue signaling. Um, whereas in an institutional plurality system, the elections might be more about, if there were elections, it might be more about practicalities. And this, this is an important one. In the, in the political system that we have, results don't matter. Um, A, because most election cycles are so short and the issues being discussed are so large that you can't, nobody can actually produce results, um, especially in any election where there's a two-year cycle, like in most legislative bodies. Um, it's not impossible to accomplish anything, not in two years, but from the point where you win the election and the next day where you start running for that next election again. So you've got to be asking people to vote for you, not based on what you do, but based on what you believe. 
Um, and that, uh, that is in part perpetuated by some of the dynamics built into this winner takes all system. But you have to show people that you are the one that they are supposed to trust. And because you can't do that with results, you have to do it with beliefs. And so it creates this incentive for ideologies to sort of take over the discussion um, through these um, selection processes. The winner takes all system is actually very centralized versus the institutional plurality system, which is actually distributed and decentralized. And it's funny because, you know, I think that people think about um, a lot of people in politics like to sort of talk about the values that capitalism brings to our uh, economy. But the way that they actually run their politics is almost more like communism. There's no competition in our political, very little competition in our political elections. Competition is stamped out. Uh, opponents are discouraged and wars waged against them before they can even announce. Major roadblocks are put up. Major things are done to prevent people from challenging people. And the entire system of loyalty, of finding a boss that you can kind of hitch your wagon to and riding that through, that's another way to discourage challengers the same way that primates do. And so it's actually a really non-competitive system where the decision making is made from central bodies, often the parties. And there's only two of them that really do most of the work in the United States right now. And so it's not a competitive system. It's not a decentralized system the way our economy is. And part of what I believe is that although there are some downsides to capitalism for sure, there are some incredible upsides in that it often produces ridiculous innovation um, as long as certain conditions are met in the markets that it's working in. And I believe that would be the case in politics if they were more competitive. But having a system that is built on only one group being in charge and the other group being not in power doesn't create um, any incentive for, um, for competition, right? The incentive is to eliminate the competition, to build your side up, to disempower the other side. However, if the system that you had was more institutional plurality and it wasn't based on one side running the system, you actually remove the need to try and keep, excuse me, you remove the need to keep people from participating because they aren't going to take over the system either. They're just going to be sitting at the table the same way that you're sitting at the table. Um, and this is, might be a sort of like in the weeds example, but one of the things that I found um, from when I was in office uh, as a mayor in South Orange was one of the issues that people complained a lot about was road resurfacing. Um, and this has happened in, in the towns that I've worked in as a business administrator or town manager as well. Um, and uh, in a lot of towns, road resurfacing is one of the kind of political favor policies given out, whether intentionally or unintentionally, by the people that are in charge. Uh, whether they do it on purpose by paving roads in an order uh, that they know are going to net them the biggest political benefits, which you can be sure most of many of your local elected officials are doing. Um, or they do it unintentionally by, uh, you know, somebody complaining and then they take that complaint and move it right into um, doing something about it without doing a broader analysis of what the needs actually are. But so in South Orange, we had a spreadsheet that we used to do the road resurfacing. That spreadsheet was built by our municipal engineers who evaluated the conditions of the roads. In the other the towns that I've worked in as an administrator, we used a computer program to do that where a car actually scans all the streets with LIDARs and 3D cameras and all these things, and it builds um, a complete uh, online kind of data portal of the condition of all of your road surfaces um, in a very quantifiable, objective way. Now, I met with a lot of people when I was mayor. This was one of the, one of the many areas that I wanted to push back on uh, people sort of demand to doing things in a certain way. So people would come to me. Um, and I remember in, in one particular case, there was uh, a resident who was in my office hours that I had every week. Um, and was furious that their road wasn't being uh, paved that year. And I forget, I think the road was maybe on the list for the next year or the year after that. But they were, they, he was 100% sure that his road was the worst condition road in the town. And he went as far as to show me a picture of his daughter, a very young kid who uh, hurt herself um, and needed uh, some, a bandage on her arm because she fell off her bike in a pothole. Um, and he actually showed me the picture and said, you know, is this what you want? Is this what you want? My daughter to get hurt. Um, and of course, my response was like, obviously, that's not what I want. If you think I want to see children injured, 
you know, you should be doing something other than sitting in my office hours. You should be recalling me. Um, uh, but that's sometimes how people talk. And we talked it through a little bit. Um, and I showed him how we came to the conclusions that we came to. And we talked about the different factors that our engineers used to measure the conditions of the roads. I told him that I had many other people come into my office hours who also told me that their roads were the worst in town. And which one of you am I to believe? Or am I to believe people with multiple years of schooling and using data to, uh, as best as possible, try and quantify the conditions? Um, and so he suggested, well, we can quantify this by getting petition signatures. I said, well, but what about for families that have households where there's a single parent who works? And that person's not around during the day to sign that petition. Should those neighborhoods be less entitled to getting access to municipal resources? We talked through a bunch of those different issues. And the conversation, as all of these conversations about this issue end, ended, in a way that was sort of interesting and a, re a really interesting lesson for me um, and taught me a lot early on because the frustration, you know, the person came in demanding the government do something differently. Um, and he was sure that he was right and, um, and felt that if he wasn't in there advocating for the resources going to him, um, then somebody else would be in there advocating for the resources to go to them. So the, he has to do it also. It's kind of a tragedy of the commons or kind of a prisoner's dilemma almost. And that's part of the problem with this system. Right, is it incentivizes people to push on the system in ways that they really shouldn't be because they know that other people pushing on that system can equal changing the course of government. And indeed, that happens all the time, especially in local government. Five people showing up to a council meeting, um, if they're persistent enough, can change the entire trajectory of a large project in town, even though there could be 10,000 or 20,000 or 100,000 people not at the meeting who want to see that thing move forward. And the job of the government, in my opinion, isn't just to react to what people say and do whatever they want, but is to do your due diligence. And so I did my due diligence. I worked with the engineers and we created a list. And I told our council, our governing body, that they could not change the order that we did roads, but they could decide what, they could question something and the engineers could re-review it, but they could not reorder the roads themselves based on what they believed. Prevented any corruption from happening in that process. Um, and it forced everybody to buy into the system um, a little bit better. And the discretion that they had was, well, you have the decision about how much funding you do. So you can fund doing two roads or three roads or five roads every year. And that's the decision that we're making. Not which order to do them in, but which ones to do. And we're leaving the actual decision to the professionals. And so that's just to contrast, you know, one of a thousand different specific examples of how these policies sort of play out. On one hand, you have people not trusting the system and needing to have the people in charge agree with what you agree with. Otherwise, you don't believe the system will work in your favor. And on the other end of it, you have a system that generally is transparent and you can understand and which maybe doesn't get you exactly what you want, but also can't be corrupted by anybody else. And that was the lesson from those experiences was that most, I think actually all of the people who left those conversations with me in my office hours about their road conditions they weren't thrilled because they really came in there planning to get something from, from me or from the town. Uh, but they left not really angry either. They understood, they understood the concerns with doing it the way they were suggesting. They understood. We looked at the spreadsheet. We looked at the data. You know, we looked at the, um, the different metrics that were being measured. I described how important it was for me to make decisions in this way. And that was the best possible way to make decisions. And people kind of accepted that. And they, I think what they really saw was that they couldn't change my mind, but nobody else could either. Because we had a framework in place that allowed us to optimize the kinds of decision that we were making. So just a short side note on sort of describing these two different sides of this. So in the winner takes all system, in this primate style of organizing, uh, loyalty is demanded for you to be able to operate in that system. And Anybody who works in politics absolutely knows that. Um, and anybody who's studied primates also will know that about primates. Um, but in an institutional plurality system, it does not demand loyalty. In fact, the opposite. It demands competition because you are, uh, you are entrusting that system to work out 
whatever it needs to work out to come up with the best idea possible. The winner takes all system does not incentivize competence. Um, and um, whereas an institutional plurality system may incentivize competence. Um, and in a winner takes all system, it encourages divergent narratives because finding truth isn't important, but being right is important. Um, and, um, and in an institutional plurality system where you have a system that the governing system includes people who disagree with you, and every time you make a decision, you kind of have to, the whole group has to work together to find the, um, to find the best decision, that system encourages convergent narratives because you have to compromise among a group of people who don't agree with each other. And so everybody can't believe their own thing. You have to find common threads and build those up and build those up the same kind of as was done in the Constitutional Convention that produced the United States Constitution, um, a process that encouraged convergent narratives, um, which is the only way that document was able to be put together, um, which so many differences of opinion. Um, in the winner-takes-all system, there is accountability on the political side, whereas on the institutional plurality system, there is accountability on the systemic side. And I mentioned this last one, but it's really important. On the winner-takes-all system, there is no incentive for truth. There is only an incentive to be right. In an institutional plurality system, there is a culture of finding truth, or at very minimum, a culture of finding things that everybody basically, or a lot of people basically agree on. So these are just... Um, two different ways to think about kind of two different ends of the spectrum. Um, and it's important to do because each of the things that I talked about are sort of base values that um, sort of uh, uh, create a bunch of subsequent policies, rules, behaviors, expectations, and how the system works. Um, and so it's going to be really important to have this framework as we do some of our other analysis. And there are really practical takeaways here. I talk about this in the classes that I teach um, in Seton Hall's Master of Public Administration program. As a manager, uh, I try to build teams of people who don't necessarily all agree with each other because I want to hear all of the ideas and I want to provide an environment where the best idea could come from anybody at any given time um, and create a culture of convergent narratives and create a culture of truth over ego. Um, that's not the way that it works in most places. Um, and most of us, upon reflecting on it, can probably feel that, especially those of us who worked in politics. What you're supposed to do is back your boss no matter what they say or do. Um, and that does not produce the best outcomes. That is an outgrowth of this loyalty policy that allowed uh, chimpanzees to navigate the ranks in their own political societies and which we have inherited and built into our political societies. But if we want to move forward, and take another milestone step in the evolution of the governance of our species, we have to consider these dynamics at this really deep level. We have to admit that our political system actually works in a centralized, non-competitive way, and that we, uh, if we want to see the kind of innovation in the public sector that we've seen in the private sector throughout the history of our country, we have to create markets that are competitive in the political process. And to do that, we have to change the incentives um, on how a lot of the different pieces of this are uh, kind of put together. We have to find a way to create a system that creates competition and demands truth and requires accountability and disincentivizes blind loyalty, even if that cuts out power for many of the current institutional stakeholders. We have to create a system that incentivizes seeking truth rather than being right. We have to create a system that actually welcomes and searches for disagreement rather than allowing egos and false positive feedback loops to blind people into seeing um, things the way that they've always wanted to see things, which causes so much bad policy and bad programming. We have to figure out a way to create shared goals of progress and decouple our really fragile egos from decision making such that we can create a really ultra competitive marketplace of ideas that speak to these broad truths rather than hyper-targeted narratives. Can we have real competition in a two-party system? Do we need more people to vote? Do we need campaign finance? Do we need more people to run for office? We're gonna start asking and answering some of these questions about how to reconceptualize, redesign 
or implement differently within or outside of the system that we have. For example, there are a number of things that we can change, I think, within the constitutional framework that we have that would make a really big difference. Um, and there might be other things that would require amendments to that constitution, or maybe even a whole new framework, like a modern constitutional convention. For example, my belief is that there is a lot of evidence to suggest that a three-party system would uh, net a really incredible uh, benefit over a two-party system. We're going to discuss that in, a, um, in one of the next episodes. And we're going to discuss how systems like ranked choice voting don't just cost less than regular elections, but actually produce results that are more in line with what people actually want. And we're going to discuss why it's important to recruit people to run for office who don't fit the traditional psychological makeup of your typical politician and the problems with the kinds of people who make up most of our positions and leadership in the public sector in the United States. So stick around for the next episode where we're going to be bringing in some guests to talk about some of these issues and diving further into them as we explore some of the deficiencies in our current system. Now, is there a specific policy that you want us to sort of evaluate or assess or analyze? Let me know on social media or by email, or if you have any questions or comments about anything that you've heard um, in this episode. I'd be happy to talk um, or share more. So thanks again for joining, and I will see you on episode six. Thank you, everyone.